Has anybody ever seen Gremlins? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a, a gentleman here that was in Gremlins. I don't know if you've seen him. If you haven't, later on, you can get his autograph and get a photo from him. And it's Mr. Zach Gallagher. Can we have a round of applause, please? Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Oh, works. Sounds better than yesterday, too. Yeah. I'll just have to sit right here. I've got the quieter one. You've got the quieter one. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Hi, oh, yeah. Hi. How you doing? Hi. How's Gloucester? Cool? Yeah! Nice and sunny outside. Ready to go for a walk. It's a little bit better than what it was yesterday, I was It was a bit, a bit stormy yesterday. Yeah, just a bit. We had thund yeah. a bit of thunderstorms. So, um, how are you liking it here? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really gotten a chance to see much of it because I've been working hard to please you guys and do chats and sign things and stuff like that. But it looks like very beautiful, typical English countryside is what it looks like. Do, do you like doing uh, the comic cons? I do. Uh, they're actually, and maybe people wouldn't realize this, but they're actually very uh, educational and informative for me too because it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the influence and the impact that your work has until you meet people and they tell you like when I was a kid you were part of my childhood or when I was this was so I mean you, when you're an actor you do a movie and you go off the set and then they edit it for months and it goes away and then it just sort of gets sent out into the world and has its impact and you as an actor don't really really feel it other than maybe people coming up to you in the street going, I hey, saw so you in Waxwork, nice job, oh, Gremlins, how's Gizmo, you know, so you get the occasional, maybe once a day or sometimes on off weeks, maybe once a week or something like that. But at these shows, you really meet people who are hardcore fans who somehow have been fundamentally impacted by the work that myself and everybody else here has done, and uh, it seems to have kind of a more left more of a kind of personal mark or a personal stamp on them in terms of like how they enjoyed it and experienced it or else why would they be here if they didn't really, if they didn't really have kind of a genuine love for it. So when you meet people who really have a genuine love for what you've done, it's, it's really um, kind of humbling and impactful. It, it, it has, it's kind of the opposite thing where, you, uh, I, at least for me, I don't walk away going like, wow, I'm amazing because I was in there. I'm like, wow, it's kind of an incredible feeling that you've you've kind of touched people for decades with this movie that's still on every Christmas, it's on Netflix in America right now, and it just never seems to go away. So it's kind of an awe-inspiring feeling to have something, been part of something that lasts for so long. I mean, you've gone on three, three and a half decades now, it's kind of amazing. The, the thing is, is, that's just it, it is like never ending. Because even if somebody watched it today, it wouldn't look old. It's still, it's, it, people can still engage everything with it. Well, it, 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 it's it, funny you say that because when we, how do I, how do I not get this to be distorted? Well, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just distorted. <laughs> um, when we were shooting Gremlins, there was kind of a conscious effort not to make it dated. So we did as much as we could kind of not to have a lot of technology, not to have a specific place where it is, not to have a specific year that it was shot in, not to have a specific time. So it's kind of like any town, USA, you know, at any time, any place, anywhere. So it was not it was not designed with specificity in mind. It was designed to sort of have a kind of a timeless quality. And I think that helps make it less dated than perhaps some some other films, because it's not very heavily reliant on technology or anything like that. It's just kind of a timely story about a kid who gets a present and the present goes awry and the present kind of subconsciously symbolizes the good and the evil sides of, you know, the, the good and the naughty sides of human nature and our desires to be good and our desires to be destructive and tear things up. And I think that's why it has kind of a universal appeal because it, at its core, it really just sort of talks fundamentally about being what it's like to be a human. Um, it just does it through Gizmo, a sort of representative of the two sides of human nature. And 
the gremlins being the flip side of human nature, where we're, we're the angry nine-year-old that wants to tear tear stuff up. Um, so there you go. What did everybody think of gremlins? Did they enjoy it? Yeah. Flip, flip, flip. Well, they wouldn't be at the panel if they yeah. were. Yeah. First, first, oh, first, 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 first time. Let's go to the panel. Yeah, but <laughs> do, you know, do you know first first time you watched it? Did you think, oh, I've got to watch that again? You, yeah. You get that. Uh, that's how I look. What did you think of it first time you you saw it? The first time I saw it, it was absolutely nothing like I thought it was going to be. It had no relation to the movie that I thought I made. So the first time I saw it, I thought it was bad. But I swear, yeah, I saw it. At, I saw it at a super private screening, with where it's just me and Phoebe Cates, who played my girlfriend in it, and the and the director and the and the producer, and they were all anxious to see what we thought. And I thought I was in some super exciting action movie where we're running and this and I'm coming in with a sword and chopping off heads and it's that old pulse pounding action movie and instead I'm trapped in some massive Bugs Bunny cartoon with gremlins in it and it was the tone was so weird and jolting and jarring and strange and so not what I expected that Phoebe and I walked out and they were like they were like what'd you think what'd you think and I said can I have a minute <laughs> they're like what and I went out with Phoebe, and I was like, what'd you think? And she's like, I don't know, is it any good? I said, I, I don't know. Does it suck? She goes, it, it could. <laughs> I mean, we saw it with no, no audience. It's just two, just us who were in it. You know, there's no feedback, no nothing. It's just the images on the screen. Then what do we do? I don't know. Let's, let's go back in. Is it a disaster? I mean, it could be. It could be great. It could be, I'm like, couldn't tell what we had. So we went back in, they're like, what do you think? We're like, oh, it's great, it's fantastic, we loved it. It's exactly what we thought it would be. And then we spent one really restless, or I spent one really restless night going, oh my god, I'm in this bomb. And then the next day we went to see it at the Chinese theater with 1,500 people. And within 10 minutes they were hanging on every word, and by the time we got to the scene where the mom takes on all the gremlins in the, in the kitchen, the people were screaming and shouting and laughing so much you couldn't hear any of the dialogue that was coming off the screen. And Phoebe was sitting right in front of me and to my right, uh, so that I was seeing the back of her head. She turned around to me and she goes, this is going to be one of the biggest films of the summer. And I was like, it sure feels like it. And then it came out with pretty, actually, fairly minimal advertising. Like, I mean, it wasn't a huge push, it wasn't a non-existent push, but it was just a moderate push and it came out and just blew up and then the next week it did something that was unheard of which is stayed in the same number of screens instead of dropping like a third it went up 12 percent so it increased from the second weekend in, in terms of making money from the first one which it almost never does it almost always drops a bit and that's what we knew we really had you know, just a monster yeah. on our hands and just took off for the rest of the summer and and what's really fun for me now is how much just some of the terminology from the movie has entered the world lexicon. Like, before the movie, people really didn't know what gremlins were. You kind of did if you were really much older and were in World War II, because there's a World War II phrase about, you know, how things would go wrong with the planes. They'd say there were gremlins in the planes. But by 1983, it had really fallen out of usage. And so now, you know, Everywhere on the internet, people be like, oh, you know, my computer's got gremlins in it, or my car's got gremlins in it, or I shouldn't have fed this, my computer after midnight, because now it doesn't work. And all of these, all of these things for the movie have entered the, 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 the English, Latin, and the worldwide lexicon, and stuff like that. even in Japan, when they do the translations, you'll see like, yeah, it must have been, you know, the gremlins that caused this to, so it's, it's really fun to see how much how much it's just become a kind of a fundamental part, especially in America, of American culture. Um, and to be a part of it is, is, it's, I understand it intellectually, but it, emotionally it's bizarre and, and it, I mean, just, it's mind boggling, really, especially for it to be you know, like a third of a century later and to still be here and talking about it, people be excited about it and then asking if there's going to be a Gremlins 3. Which there is. Um, 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 um,
Could you tell us a little bit? I wish I could. I don't know anything about it except what Chris Columbus says in the interviews. And it's funny because I read the interview and then I come to these shows and I repeat what Chris Columbus says in the interview. And people go, Zach Gallagher spills the beans about Kremlin's 3. And I'm just repeating what anybody can read in the interview. I don't have any special secret knowledge. I haven't read the script. They haven't even called me. They never do. They never do until about two months before they're like, you ready to do this? I'm like, yeah. I'm ready. Uh, but... Uh, they do years and years of work on these movies before they ever have anything to do with me. Because it's easy, they just go, you want to do it? Yeah, let's do it, it's going to be six weeks there and this is what we're paying you and let's go. So it takes an hour to deal with me and it takes two, you know, two years to build the puppets. So I'm kind of like pretty low on the chain of priorities because and it's pretty easy to deal with me. They don't have to prefabricate me and so make 50 versions of me like they do with the gizmo. You will, you will do it again. I better do it. I mean, yeah. It's, my, it's like, I uh, kind of feel like it's... Well, that'd be great. Partially. That'd be great, yeah. I feel like partially, partially my franchise, right? Yeah, I mean, too right, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, Billy and Gizmo, it's like, come on. Yeah, it's It goes together like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> what, would, what would you say to people if they wanted to get into acting? What would you say to Stay them? as far away from acting as you possibly can. <laughs> I would say, unless, the only reason I would say you should get into acting is if you absolutely, positively, 100% can't ever see yourself doing anything else. If it feels like a life and death thing for you, where I have to get on stage, I have to get in front of the camera, I have to express myself, I have to play different people, I have to explore the human condition, then I would say, then you better go for it, you better go for it 100 miles an hour. And if I had one piece of advice, I would say start as soon as possible. If you can start when you're 12, start when you're 12. Start when you're 16, start when you're 16. You know, if you want to get into acting, start yesterday. The last thing you want to do is wait until you're 22 and you get out of university, or college as we call it in the States, and suddenly you now have to compete against everyone else who's just gotten out of university. So if you'd started when you were 20, you'd go up against 10 people. Now that, it's 20, now that you're 22, you're going to go up against 200 people, 2,000 people who've just gotten out of, out of college and out of drama schools. So why would you want to increase your competition 100-fold when you don't have to? And there's a reason why you know, Jennifer Lawrence won an Oscar by the time she was 24. She started when she was 14. So when you start when you're 14, you get your training and your chops and your this and your experience. And your, you play somebody's daughter and you're not the lead in the movie and so you make mistakes, they're not really noticeable, you're not carrying the movie and everything, you learn your craft. So by the time that you're, you know, ready to carry a movie when you're usually about, you know, maybe 20 at the youngest, 20, 21, something like that, and you start carrying teenage films and stuff like that, then, then you're ready to go. But if you're waiting until you're 25 to like live out your dream, that's a big problem. It's a big problem because this profession is as we like to say, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And the gun went off a while ago, and everybody else is running, so why are you sitting still? You have to get off your bum and start running as fast as you can, because everybody wants to do this. So if you want to do it, start yesterday, and start with passion, and don't refuse to lose. Realize you're going to have a tremendous amount of ups and downs. You have an unbelievable amount of disappointment. And even though, like, I've done it for 36 years and I have 70 credits on IMDb and I'm thrilled I've still been turned down for 98% of the stuff I went out for. So you better make rejection your friend. Because it's going to be there constantly and you can't take it personally. You're going to get said no to a lot. It's not because you're inferior, you're terrible, you're bad, or you're untalented, or you're lame, or whatever. It's because you're not right for it. And when you're not right for it, you're not right for it. And that's just the way it is. And you shrug it off and you go, great, let's go into this one. No? Great. No? Great. No? Fantastic. No? Okay, cool. In fact, I believe it was your countryman, Winston Churchill, that said the secret to success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And that's the secret to success in acting. You can't let it get you down. Like Neil Young said, don't let it bring you down. you got to... Um, you got to stay positive and you got to realize in that one shining moment when you break through and you get that first part and you see yourself on the telly and your family sees yourself on the telly for the first time and people lose their collective minds or seeing you on ITV or BBC <laughs> Two or, or whatever it is will be one of the greatest, most exciting moments in your life and it'll be even better if you struggled rather than just having it handed to you on, on a platter with no effort.
because you want to you want to get rewarded for hard work. You don't want to get rewarded for showing up because you don't learn anything from that, right, Theo? You learn, yeah, yeah, yeah. You learn from studying and working hard, looking at films. Didn't mean to single you out. But a young man came up to me, and he was really quite clever, so I thought I'd encourage him a little bit, too. Since when you're 12, you want as much encouragement as you can get. Sorry, passionate rant, but there you go. <laughs> so, do you know when you went for your audition for Gremlins? Can you remember it? Yeah, like yesterday. I can remember it was every audition I've ever done before, yeah. So, for you. So, Even though it's been 2,500 of them. So, do you know when they actually told you you got the part? Sure. Yeah. How did you feel? How, you know. Well, I tried out for it on a. Uh, I did my final audition on a Friday morning, um, and I read with Phoebe Cates. And then we got to remember, I was 19 at the time, so I was a kid. And uh, like most American kids, in March, I decided that I was going to go down to Fort Lauderdale for spring break, which is down in Florida. Probably getting pounded right now by the hurricane. Um, and. So I got an, I did my audition, went straight to the airport for the audition, flew down to Florida and was like unpacking my bags and going, going to the pub, as you would say, for like my first drink and celebrate just like having a week off down in Florida and, you know, going to go and chase girls and drink and do what 19-year-olds do. And no sooner than I had the first cocktail in my hand, someone said, you got a phone call back to the hotel. Because the pub was down the road, so I put the drink down, went back, and it was my mom. And she said, uh, I've played a trick with her many times before. Whenever I got a part, I'd come home and I'd go, you'll never believe who got the role in whatchamacallit. And she knew it was something I'd going up for. And she'd go, oh no, who? I'd be like, your son, me. I got it. She's like, what? Oh my god! You get all excited like that. She got on the phone. She said, guess who got the role in Gremlins? And I thought she was maybe, I, I didn't want to believe it, but I thought maybe she was playing a reverse trick on, <laughs> on me. And I said, oh god, who? And she goes, you did. Oh, my heart just sank in, in the biggest combination of so many emotions at the same time that you could feel, and relief, and anxiety, and freaking out, and oh my god, and it's the lead, and it's a Spielberg movie, and it's going to take months, and it's in California, and I've never been there, from the other side of the country. I, you know, I, I just fear, and thrilled, and... and terror and everything, every, am I going to be able to do it, will I get fired, every insecurity you ever had coming up again. Any actor that tells you that they're completely secure is probably, probably pulling your leg. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe Daniel Day-Lewis is finally secure, you know, after winning 17 Oscars or whatever it is, but most actors are almost always kind of questioning themselves a little bit. So yeah, so I got super excited and then I got on the plane. The, ne the same day, or no, ne I couldn't get a flight until the next morning, so I got on a flight the next morning and flew home. And uh, there was no internet then, so they couldn't like email me the script, because people didn't, people didn't know what email was. The only thing they had on computers was that Pong game, you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, I was back in the horse and buggy era, before the internet. How long did it take you to read the script and think, right, I've got to memorize all this, etc.? Well, of course, the amazing thing about film acting is you never really have to memorize more than about two pages of dialogue a day because they only do a couple of pages, two, three pages a day on big movies because they, in order for it to look so big and beautiful and perfect, so many different things have to go into it from whether it's lighting and angles and perfect camera movements and everything technically has to be flawless in order for it to have that big budget, smooth, you know, ultra professional feeling that kind of audiences now pretty much demand. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing was, I had to agree to do the movie without reading the script. They wouldn't let me read the script. They said, do you want to do it or not? I said, well, can I see it? They're like, no. I said, what do you mean, no? They're like, you can't see it. It's top secret. So you're either in or you're out. And so the only thing I knew was the audition scene that I did, which was the scene where I asked TV out on a date, which really doesn't have anything to do with the movie. It's just kind of a generic, boy meets girl, boy asks girl out on a date scene. So it had nothing to do with Gizmo or Mockwai or Gremlins or blowing up movie theaters. Spoiler, I blow up the movie theater. Um, uh, so there was none of that in there. So I basically had to sign on the dotted line and then they handed me the script. I had to go into the office and read it. 
I couldn't take a copy with me. And then eventually, um, I got a copy, and, and, and it was one of those copies that had my name watermarked on every single page. So you would open it, it would have Zach Galligan stamped on it. So that way, if the script ever got out of my hands, uh, if it's stamped with a man name on it, obviously I was the culprit. And so you would have your name stamped on it, you would have your name stamped on it, and everything. That's how they kind of kept track of of the 10 to 12 copies that they would give out for public consumption. But they were, back then, Spielberg was very, very diligent about who got to see scripts and when. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Has anybody got any questions? We've got time for a couple of questions. Yeah, we've got time for a couple of questions, yeah? Here we go. I just wondered if you managed to actually keep any memorabilia from the film. It's so amazing. That is this probably the second most popular question that I ever get. Is it, did, I manage, did, did, did you get to keep anything when you did Gremlins? Um, I guess that's a fantasy that you get to do the movie, you get to keep like a gizmo or something like that. Each gizmo cost about, in 1983 dollars, about forty to 45,000 dollars US to build. So they're not really, if you know anything about film companies, it's not really going to hand you $45,000 worth of merchandise to just kind of take home and play with. If you feel like, yeah, take one, yeah, give one to your friends as well. It's kind of like if you're doing the Fast and the Furious movies, they're like, would you like to take a couple of cars with you home? <laughs> it's just not what studi studios do. So the answer is no, not really. And in fact, even more kind of like almost insultingly, when I did Gremlins 2, they would make me, every time I'd leave the studio, they'd make me pop my boot and search my car to make sure they wasn't stealing one. And I said, you do realize I'm like an actor in the movie, they're like, that's why we're checking your car. And I said, why? And they said, because you've got opportunity to take it. Okay, it's kind of counterproductive steal from your own movie though, isn't it? You don't want to lose a gizmo, do you? We don't know if you're going to fence these gremlins behind closed doors and auction them. I was like, all right, pop, take a look at the boot, it's empty. Nothing there but the spare tire. I've got another question. Here we go. What was it like working with Steven Spielberg? Well, the thing about Steven Spielberg is that he... I'm grateful to him because he cast the movie. He essentially picked me and Phoebe and did a lot of... Um, a lot of editing with the script. The script initially was much, much darker and more vicious, like uh, in the scene where uh, my mom goes up into the attic and the gremlins pop out and they cut her head off and her head rolls down the stairs. And Steven Spielberg read the script and was like, yeah, that's that's not gonna happen. That's probably not gonna happen. And then Gizmo dies halfway through the script and turns into Stripe. And Spielberg read that and went, "Yeah, that's that's not gonna happen either. Um, he's gonna live and he's gonna be your sidekick. It's such a great character where you're killing him halfway through the script. It doesn't really seem to make much sense. So, uh, what was your question again? Did it answer? What was it about Burning Steve? So he was doing Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom probably for about 75% of it. So he was in, um, I think it was Sri Lanka at the time. So he came back and I probably only spent about 10 days with him on the first one. And then he seemed to be around a lot more for the second one. But he, what, with him, what you see is what you get. If you see an interview with him and you see sort of like a quirky, fun, film, nerdy kind of a guy who's like intensely into movies, that, uh, that's pretty much... You know, the way I would describe him is deeply, deeply obsessed with, with films, but I, she said, are we still friends? I don't think we were ever friends. I mean, we were, we were friendly and we were business associates, but I don't, I don't get on the phone with him and say, how's the yacht going? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that kind of relationship with him. Let's, let's do that young man over there, I mean, squeeze him in. Uh, what was it like when you got um, going into your first audition? For Gremlins or just in general? Just in general. Um, you know, it's an extremely intimidating process auditioning, especially depending on who you who you're auditioning for. Um, and I think it's really all in the way that you approach an audition. You can look at in an audition in two different ways, and I think there's definitely one way is better than the other. You can kind of look as an audition as an opportunity for you to fail, or as kind of like a referendum on you as a person, 
right? You go in, are you talented? Are you good? Are you going to this? Are you going to fail? Are you going to be good? It's like a, you can look at it as like a test. In which case, I think you'll probably do poorly. Or, to quote Al Pacino, who's a pretty good actor, you can use it as an opportunity to do the thing that you love, which is it's an, an audition is a chance for you to act. And he says, I never audition, I only act. So if I go in and I do an audition, I'm acting. If I'm in front of a camera, I'm acting. If I'm on stage, I'm acting. I don't, I don't separate it into different categories. It's always doing something that I'm passionate about. So that if you go in and you decide to really feel something, have, take, have an emotional connection with the material, go in, do your best, and you throw it out there, let the chips fall and, and let chips lie where they may, and not be focused on the outcome or trying to prove anything or trying to prove to yourself that you're a decent actor or a good person or that your mom loved you or anything like that. If you get the psychology out of it and you go in and sort of treat it like a child as an opportunity to go in and play and have fun and have a great experience and do what you love, I think that's an extremely effective way to audition. Don't take it too seriously. Don't put tons of pressure on yourself. Go in and have a blast. And if you get it, great. And if you don't get it, great. You're going to get rejected, so who cares? You know, the, the great moments is going to be when someone says, you know what, you're exactly what we want. And then you go, thank you very much. And you learn from your successes, and you learn from your failures, and you don't beat yourself up. You keep an emotional keel. And you keep doing it until you're successful. Keep banging your head against the wall, and eventually, like a giant rhinoceros, smashing against the wall, you'll come break through, break on through to the other side. That's a good lyric, so why don't you put that in the song? <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah, can we have a round of applause?